cover, read all the verses. Tell me about your favorites on vinyl and vision. So what you got here, man? Bo Diddley's Beach this Party. This is my newest one, actually. You just picked this up? Yeah, I finally got it last week. I'm a huge cool. Bo Diddley fan, and I have a couple of his albums, and this is always the one that they say is like... I don't know. I read some review that was like, if you don't have this, you don't know anything about rock music. And I was like, shit. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll buy it. <laughs> cool, man. So that's I'm a reissue? That's like a uh, new, new record? Yeah, it's on Sundays, uh, who do a lot of reissues. I actually find most of the stuff I buy these days is either from Sundays or one of their other labels, like Modern Harmonic is really cool. Actually, a lot of the stuff I've been getting... It's from them recently. This is a oh, one I got at the beginning Hopkins? of this year. Yeah. I'm a big Layton and Hopkins fan. This one looks pretty cool because it's on root beer vinyl. And this was like one of his more obscure albums and he recorded it by himself and kind of just oh, nice. pulled it out of nowhere. Yeah. And he plays piano and he plays organ, which he never does. He kind of just screwed around for the whole record. Cool. It ended up being something that I really liked. That's great. Like so, uh, I said, I well, like weird stuff. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I see that. Um, so what would you say is like the most either rare or valuable record you've got? Um, let's see, rare or valuable. Well, off the top of my head, and I could be wrong, but um, oh. I bought this in probably 2008. And it's just a, I mean, it's a reissue collection, mm -hmm. but it's uh, the complete, like, Black Sabbath singles of the Aussie era. If I can even open it. So that's like It what? came in a leather bomb box. It's like a single from every album, I suppose? Kind of. Well, it's got Evil Woman, Wicked World, Paranoid with the Wizard, Laguna's Dream, yeah. I mean, Tomorrow's Dream, Laguna's Sunrise, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath with Changes, oh. a little lot of Never Say Die. And oddly enough, they pull... The weirdest one, they have a hard road from Never Say Die with Symptom of the Universe from Sabotage on the B-side, which is like their heaviest song. But uh, even being a reissue, this was like only, I think it was $45 when I looked it up. Yeah. And I remember a few years ago, I actually checked what this specific set was selling for, the reissue set, and yeah. it was over 250 bucks. Wow. And I was kind of surprised because... It's a reissue, but it was kind of a short run, and yeah. it's pretty nice. It was funny, because at the time, I just was like, well, I didn't have a lot of 7 Inches, or even a lot of Black Sabbath, huh. and so this was kind of almost like my, I was like, well, maybe it's, if you put it together, it's like a best of. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I don't know if it's the most valuable. It might be. Yeah. <laughs> well, with what you said, I mean, it's, I guess it's possible, but... What's, uh, what's your second runner in that case? Hmm, let me think. Because like I said, I actually do buy a lot of reissues. So, because uh, yeah. like I, I want quality and stuff that looks interesting. Yeah. I do have a lot of stuff that's like really short run. Like I remember I kind of got a record player to get, I was really into Southern Lord Records who were like a doom metal drone label. And I was really into this drone band, Sun. Wow. Or some people call Sun O. They're like oh, a drone okay. band, but they have a lot of really unique records, and this was like a short-run EP that they did on a 12-inch. Huh. And uh, it was pretty cool because it was actually composed as background music to an art exhibition where somebody created Sun's backline with cast resin and salt. So that's actually the art exhibit, and the record is actually what played in the exhibit when people visited it. Wow. Sun is a very weird band, if you've ever heard. No, it's not really like know. music or anything. I don't know. I saw a meme recently that was like, people say who say they listen to everything, and then, pe then people hear Sun, and it was like the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. I guess if you could think of what like a black hole sounds like, and like how it would make your physic, like how it like it would make you feel physically with right. how low it is, like that's kind of the best way to describe it. Okay. Here's actually another thing they did. This is cool because it's in, this is a live album that they recorded in a church. Oh, wow. In, I think, it was, the church is called Domkirk. Oh, Bergen, which I think is in Norway. I hope I'm not wrong. Bergen Cathedral. And they actually used the acoustics of the church 
and that's actually photos of them playing. And this is like a double LP. And as you can see, they're wearing robes and they're pretty mysterious. Yeah. It's actually them on the back. Huh. They've always had like a pretty strong lack of an image. Actually, I saw them play at AS220 in Providence, and it was the most hallucinatory thing I've ever seen, and I was almost completely sober. Wow. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to say anything about the CDs, about as far as, like, you know, being a vinyl show. Uh, you, have good, you have good vinyl. I know. I definitely don't have as many, yeah. but uh, I was always more selective, and uh, I remember, like, a decade ago when vinyl was kind of coming back, there were bands I listened to, like Sun, who I showed you, or like Nunslaughter in particular, uh, who were doing a lot of vinyl-only releases. And since I bought physical media, I was getting like, kind of, uh, well, that's a bummer. Like, I want to get that release. I remember like Discharge, one of my favorite bands, did a split seven inch with MG15, and I couldn't get it because there was no CD. Yeah. And I remember when I finally bought my first record player, I like had my list pretty much of like, these are, I'm buying this because these are all the records I can't get on CD. Not that vinyl doesn't get worn out, but, yeah. I mean, for instance, we're gonna play a record from the 60s, and yeah. I didn't own it for a lo like most of its lifetime, but somebody took decent enough care of it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what, I also wanted to make sure that we talked about your band because- uh, Oh yeah, I'm in a band. We haven't said anything about it yet. So, um, and oh, by we're going to talk your, about someone else's music. Yeah, no, and, and yours, because uh, I really, I really like what you what you have. Because uh, we actually just met through through Instagram. I, I found your page and I listened to your music, and I was just like, "Wow, these guys are awesome." Um, well, thanks. Would you would you say that, would you say that it's fair to or is it fair to say that you guys are a like psycho garage rock band? Well. I, see, that's like a, a kind of a new one, okay. and I and I, I like it because uh, honestly, a lot of people say a lot of different things, and I yeah, was kind of uh, shocked. Well, because like I always thought we were just a blues rock band, and yeah. like that was kind of like I would just say, yeah, we're like blues rock, and people would often say that I undersold myself or what I did, hmm. and I have heard like a lot of people call us blues metal or punk blues mm -hmm. I had a drummer who's uh, one of his relatives came and he said to me after we played oh you know I never heard a, a punk band that had a harmonica and I was like cool but it is kind of funny like some people and I know some blues fans can be kind of elitist and honestly like true blues fans I noticed are almost the only people we played with who really didn't kind of dig us Oh, yeah. And the only times I've had seen people, or had people genuinely heckle or put fingers in their ears was at blues shows. Yeah. And I was kind of shocked, because like, I wanted to be a blues singer. Yeah. But I kind of like that, Psycho Garage Rock. We actually, our newest single got licensed to a garage rock label in Turkey recently. And they kind of specialize in stuff that's really wacky and aggressive, I noticed. But uh, it was called, I hope I say it right, it was Kadafan Contact Records from Istanbul, Turkey. And I asked him, what does is, what is your label name mean? And he goes, oh, it kind of roughly translates to like crazy or nuts or stuff like that. And those are the bands I try to get. So I was kind of like, okay. Well, so you're in your company, you know, that's kind of fun. <laughs> to speak to your uh, comment earlier about the... the playing with blues and you feeling like that was where you were the least accepted. Uh, blues is kind of like a purist type genre. Oh, yeah. For the most part, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of strong, you know, blues guys that are just like, if there's, there's a right, the right way to do it. Like, you can't do it in another It's way. true. Yeah. I've, I've noticed that the guys we play with who are in bands, though, have always been cool to me. It's just kind of yeah. the fans sometimes. And not a lot of them, but I think that's kind of why we appeal to punks and metalheads because we have yeah. that aggression and like the kind of bit of darkness in the image but we've always gone down really well at like bars or clubs with kind of like an older crowd who are used to classic rock right. because they're used to hearing blues riffs that are heavy right. and we used to play a lot of canned heat and like i did covers of songs i liked that i didn't think people even knew about and it was usually like the ed the more educated fans who would know but like 
at the same time, like, you if we played like a T Rex song, and we do it really heavy, but like you know, the older ladies would get make their husbands get up and dance with them because it's like they hadn't heard that song in a while. Yeah, right. And they weren't scared off by us for having crosses in our logo or singing about this and that. Right. So it's like I don't know. We do kind of have a strange niche, I guess. That's and cool. nobody thinks we're gonna sound like what we do based on how we look and vice versa, I think. Right. I don't know. So, um, let, me, uh, let me just say that this is really cool. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna get that on camera or not, but uh, <laughs> this is one of your releases. This is not your latest release. Right? No, that was a, a double A side single we did in 2017. But uh, I'm still really proud of it, and it's still one of my favorite releases we've done on the whole, and I yeah. really like bold songs that are on it still. Yeah, no, I listen to them, and they're, they're great songs, and that's kind of why I, well, I was starting off saying, uh, would you consider it safe to say that your music is like a, you know, a psycho garage rock? Because that's kind of what this record is, it's just an EP. I think um, that record was where we, uh, we really tried to almost take it over the top, as far as like the energy was concerned and we yeah. kind of stripped down the arrangements at the same time it was my first time playing with greg blade on drums who i had on that recording and we kind of uh we stripped the music back to this really raw like almost the rawest stuff i think i'd ever made and the most aggressive but we kind of doubled i think the energy we had because like i still say rocket blasters want to almost like it's i mean my music isn't that complicated it's kind of more about the energy that I put forth, but yeah. Rocket Blaster is like, it's like a song you need like a headband and like gym bands to play, because it's like, there's a bit of athleticism, yeah. and there's very little space to breathe with how much harmonica and just the yeah. speed of it. It's pretty intricate work for, well, uh, for a fast place bluesy song like that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it took a long time to work up, and um, actually, um, the drummer I have now, we only just to kind of started practicing it the last couple of weeks because it was like I wanted to get it back in the set mm. and it is one of those things where like rather than practice our set at the last couple of practices we just practiced that song like we've dedicated a couple whole practices to it because wow. it's like there's a lot of little things in there that but when it's all just right and every little hit is just right it, it has that energy mm. so I think at the next show we're definitely gonna have to break it back out Great. Do you know when that is your next show? Or? Well, we have a show this Friday, but um, it's actually a tribute show to the Rolling Stones, and all the proceeds are going to benefit the Amos House, and it's like a bunch of local Providence bands all doing Rolling Stones covers. Oh, okay. And I think maybe we get to do some original stuff. Yeah. But uh, it's the funny thing is, is I didn't actually have to learn any new songs for it. Like, the songs we're going to do is stuff from our normal set. <laughs> so it was kind of like, well, um, can we... <laughs> I was like, can we do blues songs that the Stones were known for doing or made famous? Oh. And they were like, yeah. And I was like, okay, we don't have to learn any new songs. <laughs> uh, what brought you to that point? Like, where, where did you start listening to music or playing music? Well, um, I've always, like, music's just always been my thing since I was a little kid. Like, I just was always, I love being in the car and listening to the radio and just, yeah. like... what would you listen to? Well, my mom was, um, she's like a product of the, the, the child of the 60s, so, like, classic rock. And when I was a kid, it was all her favorite bands, like Zeppelin and Moody Blues. So and she was, like, like rock listener. Yeah. Cool. And it was funny because she didn't really, like the blues that much even though she listened to like bluesy stuff but it was kind of nice because when I started getting into the 60s culture and music myself I kind of had somebody who was there that could kind of like well this is kind of what it was really like or like yeah. it's kind of nice to be able to like hey I got this album like do you remember this band and she'd be like how are you listening to this like but it's right. kind of like she had good enough taste and my brothers were into metal I just always liked having something on, and I mostly liked metal and hard, aggressive music for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of got bit by the blues all of a sudden, like a, about a decade ago. It's funny because now I notice I've been list, I've been back listening to the first blues artist that kind of got me into it, because mm -hmm. it's like, well, I've finally been in it long enough that I can kind of 
I think I'm back where I started. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or at least people can appreciate that stuff more now. And that I think I know a little bit about it. Because I didn't know the first thing about the blues when... Mm -hmm. It was really weird. Like, I don't uh, think you lived long enough to really appreciate it, right? No, That's I mean... I mean, and I always had an ear for stuff that was older anyway. Like, even when I was in school, the punk and the metal I listened to was older. But, I mean, I was in kind of like a death metal band, and I played death metal and listened to 100% aggressive music for so long. And I literally just had a friend go, you need to chill out. Like, you need to buy something different. Like, and he, he said, like, buy now and buy the Black Keys or something. And I didn't even know who they were. But I went and bought Rubber Factory. Like, because I bought so many CDs, I was like, I'll buy a CD, buy anyone. <laughs> and it was like, I went and bought it, and knowing nothing about it, and it being nothing like anything I listened to, I was kind of like, whoa, mm -hmm. this isn't... I was literally, like, kind of taken aback by it. And I went back to the record store the next day and the day after and would buy anything that had the Fat Possum Records logo on it. Oh. So it was kind of like... Like, I didn't know a lot about the blues, and I didn't know if the Black Keys was a blues band or not. But it was weird, because by the end of the first week of having two of their albums, I was telling people, I'm going to quit playing death metal and form a blues duo. And everybody thought that was really weird. But that's what I did. Like, it took me years, but, like, it was like, I'm going to be like these guys someday. It's going to be me yeah. and a drummer, and we're going to play blues. And it was like... You don't play it anything like that. And it right. was like, well, it's going to take some time. about like you got into the blues or the black keys that's so like bush league <laughs> yeah. but i'm like well it's the band that did it for me and not even just them them being on fat possum records and also that like one of the i i mean i went back and bought anything i could find with their logo on it and right. one of the the albums was Cullahoma by the black keys which was an entire album of covers just by junior kimbrough they did a whole album of covers of their most, of their biggest influence. Yeah. Who was Junior Kimbrough, a guitar player from the Mississippi Hill Country. Not like the Delta, but like, not knowing anything about the blues, I was like, well, if the Black Keys like Junior, then I'm going to like Junior. Probably. And I kind of went to that Hill Country style more than the Delta style. Because a lot of the Hill Country guys were on Fat Possum. And it was different than 12 Bar Blues. Yeah. Most of the Hill Country guys do this really heavy, dark, droning, riffy style that was like, to me, was as heavy as metal. And I think that's why I liked it so much. Yeah. But I don't know. That's kind of where I started. And lately I've been kind of picking up Fat Possum albums that I skipped the first time around. Oh, really? And I'm like, it's kind of been that whole cycle. Yeah. It, which is weird. Like, life just kind of happens that way. So, uh... Now, where would you say that you found this record that you uh, chose for tonight? Oh, um, well, there's a couple, you know, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention t about it, but, um, I, again, just being super into, like, the 60s and whatnot, and being really into movie soundtracks, and also, like, part of what appealed to me about 60s music when I really got into it was the heaviness and the punkiness of it and being really into punk and metal I wasn't aware that those terms were around back then mm -hmm. and that there were bands in the 60s that were called punk rock or that were playing heavy yeah. metal and Ryan on Sunset Strip was kind of a, a pot boiler movie to cash in on a trend okay. like there were actual riots on Sunset Strip because of the new like psychedelic music and uh, right. what's crazy is Peter Fonda who died yesterday R.I.P. I'm a huge fan he actually got arrested in the Sunset Strip riots really so it's funny that, that we're yeah. talking about this record today because he died yesterday and I'm wearing my Easy Rider shirt yeah, I know, I saw and it. I actually I switched our our logo on Facebook and Instagram back to our Peter Fonda adapter adapter logo in his honor because yeah. like He's had a huge influence on me, not just his movies, but
but like the music in his movies has influenced my band and like the image I wanted. Yeah. So I was like, I definitely got to talk about it now. I mean, Peter Fonda got arrested in the real Sunset Strip. Right? Yeah, which actually <laughs> came out. Uh, I did a little bit of research on the movie and, and the actual riots. Or, uh, and who was it? The uh, this came out like four months after or seven months after the riots occurred yeah. on the Sunset Strip. So it was like kind of a pretty speedy production. Well, that's why like they called it like a, uh, definitely. I mean, it was uh, a cash grab, like a total like cashing in on a fad, which right. was a lot of, uh, I mean, the exploitative nature of 60s culture was kind of like that. Everything was fast, 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 mm. fast turnaround. And um, which is weird because they put out such great stuff. But like, I mean, that was a movie that was, yeah, it was thrown together to cash in on a headline. Right. Like, this is what is in people's minds. Right. And they associate it with LSD and rebellious music. So we're gonna have a whole movie about kids taking acid and rioting at, at rock clubs. Right. And like, that's pretty punk rock. And it's like yeah. the Standells who did Dirty Water, like their 60s proto-punk band are in it as themselves. and. You have the Chocolate Watch Band, who are, like, I think one of the best American bands, like, are in it. And, like, it has that weird, uh, I guess the appeal of the movie these days, like, why it kind of held up beyond being, like, a fad was that it caters to people who, like, rock movies. Yeah. Because it's a movie, like, almost about great music by accident. Because they were kind of just showing what the strip looked like, but... They didn't know that, like, what they were filming was going to be something people would want to watch 50 years later to be like, this is what club bands looked like in the 60s, and yeah. this is what these rock shows were really like. Yeah. And it's pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, I, I was reading the, I think, LA Weekly video to find out a little bit more about the actual riot, and they even said it in their article that it seemed like a, like a just a generational hissy fit. Pretty much. I was just like, yeah, that's sounds about right. There wasn't a real... <laughs> It wasn't like there was protests going on. It was really just that the kids were all dressing crazy right. and acting crazy, well, yes. and the music was really aggressive right. and heavy. But they were kids, and it's like, like teenagers. It's true. Like but that was the problem. Was just like that there these teenage people. Yeah, they're rocking out too hard right. and like fighting at, in the club right. and like and so taking the drugs that weren't even necessarily illegal yet. Like LSD was still legal in most parts. Of America in 1966 yeah and that's like a crazy thing because like kids were getting their heads smashed in for like tripping on acid and going to rock concerts and uh, technically there wasn't anything against the law with that <laughs> yeah no I mean well I guess because it started off innocently because like from the way the movie portrays it is that you know these are these 17 year old kids trying to just go out like the downtown basically <laughs> literally the like yeah. I think they used the name of real clubs on oh, yeah, set, yeah. like Pandora's Box. But I think they used another club to fill in as Pandora's Box. Right. But the weird thing is, is Pandora's Box, the real club, is in another movie that's kind of like that called Psych Out, which was like, wow. again, kids take acid, and that's a weird one because it's all about Jack Nicholson <laughs> taking acid and trying to play guitar with Strawberry Alarm Clock, like right. of Incense and Peppermint's fame. Yeah. And he does. So it's weird to see Jack Nicholson with a clip-on ponytail on acid playing guitar for Strawberry Alarm Clock, like in Austin Powers or something. <laughs> we're, we're in Norton, Massachusetts, right? <laughs> we're in right? Norton, Massachusetts at the Waco Norton compound. <laughs> yeah, all right. So you're just kind of telling me about the uh, disc golf, is it? Yes. <laughs> yeah, all right. I, I, don't, I wasn't familiar, so I had to ask you about it. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's a pretty crazy amount of land out here. It's cool. I finally went in with the for the first time in a long time. Was it scary? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had to like, but I had like a, it's weird. I, I knew it would be cool, but like, well, I'll show you what the fuck looks like. I was like, I want to get in the barn, and you need to take a photo of me, like, in the barn. And this is the same barn that is on the cover of our most, like, recent which it was just right before. I actually came out here, and it, like, I'm not a photographer, but I knew 
There was an album cover in our yard somewhere. How many ended up getting it like that day? How many in that thing? <laughs> how, dangerous, funny because, uh, uh, how dangerous is it to get through the door? Well, <laughs> it was a little less grown in, but like I never even went inside. But I had to, the actual entrance is over on the side, and I just had to right. pull the vines apart to go inside it. But, but it's, it's kind of like, but it's creepy. It's just fucking there, right? Yeah. I mean, it looks like it's gonna fall down. <laughs> so that's why it was a creepy photo, because it was like, who took the photo? So it seems like you got this from uh, in your ear. Yep. Was that? Uh, when was that? Um, it was in 2015. I think I had actually just seen the movie for like the first time, and I was kind of on like a 60s kick. But I remember I was leaving in your ear, and I had some other choices, and I saw like the orange cover like in a corner on the floor. And I think I put something else back to get that instead. But I don't know really what it was about it. It like it was my favorite record like the second I bought it. Like I just had never had something that seemed so like authentic to a time period that like I don't know, really kind of represented like I don't know, it's just definitely such a a time capsule of music and art and film. And it's super punky. And I mean, even this song, like, the Standells were kind of known for being punkier than a lot of 60s bands, and were mostly known for Dirty Water, but it's yeah. kind of cool to hear, like, an upbeat rock track with cop sirens wailing and fuzz guitar. Yeah. So, uh, as far as the value of this record is concerned, this is track, which track is this? Um, this is Sunset Theme by the Sidewalk Sounds. I was trying to get to this one right here, Old Country by Deborah yeah, Travis. This. So, um, yeah, so as far as the value of this record is concerned, the uh, very, very brief and minimal research I did into the sales history of this record, considering it's an original 67, considering it's a mono copy, and I think I can tell that because of the serial number, it's a T236, right? Because of the stereo, the stereo issues were serial number was DT five zero six five. No, this that, is a monophonic record. Exactly the T, because it's just the catalog number is T five zero six five. So I'm actually trying to determine like the uh, the value of your record, and because um, I didn't get to do too much uh, research when I was home this uh, past week, because unfortunately shit's been going on. Um, but yeah, I would say that your record here, on average, probably sells for around like seventeen to twenty-eight dollars right now. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so the quality <laughs> of yours, I would say, that's probably uh, under like the nineteen dollar range, maybe. Because it's like really good shape. It looks really, really, really kid like clean and glossy. I've also played it like, and honestly, like over a hundred times myself. Yeah. Like, it's been my favorite record since I got it. And it's always like, nobody's ever heard of this fucking weird movie no, or this, or right. any of these weird bands. People usually know, <laughs> like, you know, Love That Dirty Water. Mm -hmm. People know the standouts, but not anything else. Right. Cool, I'm going to sell it and buy another one. <laughs> There's no reissues, that's it, man. There's I know. Idea. They have a CD, and I've almost bought the CD version just to... <laughs> save on keeping like the vinyl in quality but yeah I don't know <laughs> so what's your what's your uh, position on the, the digital download well streaming? so I never really downloaded music that much like uh, even when it was like new like Napster and this and that like I had friends who did and they that's how like I would get like CDs back then it's like hey can you make me this CD right. and you'd get like all different sources and all different quality tracks but um I've just always been a very like hard copy oriented person and I've always been into collecting like physical music and um, it's only in like recent years where I, I buy so much stuff that I'm like well I should really start listening to more stuff online so I do like stream a lot and I like it. Bandcamp a lot just as like because I like how it looks it's pleasing to the eye, yeah. and like you get kind of like the uh, as far as like a website goes, I think it's like having like digital liner notes and uh, mm. just like the the interface is cool. But I find that it's like if, if I stream an album like five or six times, I, I usually end up buying it. 
<laughs> yeah, obviously you like it enough, right? Yeah, so, but it's kind of like, that's kind of more what I use now to, because I'm like, well, you can't buy everything. And I kind of like going into a lot of things blind. I buy a lot of stuff without ever listening to the band. Like, yes. even for a second. Like, uh, I don't know. I like to have, like, the whole first experience that first time. But uh, you kind of got to, like, if you're going to be selective, it's good to actually know, know what you're getting yourself into a little bit. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't so, buy a lot of stuff that I've been like, wow, this sucks. <laughs> well, when you have, like, this knack for just kind of, like, nailing things just by the cover. Well, I mean, kind of. I mean, they say, like, you can't judge a book by its cover, but sometimes, like, an album, you, you kind of can <laughs> a lot of the times. Yeah. Like, it's a good indicator. But again, like, I think it's also, like, a reason a band like mine, like, I don't think our album covers say a lot about the contents, like, right. or at least uh, it they do in a very different way. Yeah, like, it could just be interpretive, you know? Some bands do have an image that's kind of, like, at odds with their style, but can kind of match it, too. I always love, like, Black Flag's album artwork, because they always have Ray Pettibone album covers, and he has this really odd, like almost American Splendor comic style mm -hmm. and you almost would have really know that it was gonna be like well at least for a, like a hardcore punk band with that sound to have a very specific image like I feel like more of their albums look like jazz album covers than punk if not for like the kind of weird subtext of the images yeah but they're all bright colors with like comic book characters on it kind of mm -hmm. one of my favorite albums Blue Cheer been save us erupt them they, they said that their debut was the first metal album because it was from 1968 and they were a power trio that were playing Marshall stacks hmm. on full volume and they refused to turn them down so their album sounded like shit like it was the muddiest thing anybody had ever heard and it sounded awful but because it they had a record that didn't sound like anything they had a like a top 20 hit and album yeah. Because and it was the heaviest thing anybody had ever heard, but it's because like it was this blaring loud mono explosion, and it was like you're not supposed to record an amplifier this loud, right. and it was like well we're gonna do it anyway, because we're not gonna turn down because I mean they actually had the before the Who did they had the uh, Guinness World Record as the world's loudest band Blue wow. Cheer, yeah. they're like another band like. That's the funny thing about metal is like, I thought I knew everything about metal and then I found out that a 60s band is credited with being the first metal band and I was like, what, where have I been? <laughs> I got the name, I got that album tattooed the first two days after I bought it because I was like, everything I knew about metal is wrong. These yeah. guys in the 60s were whipping their hair around and playing Marshall Stacks and like doing double bass and like, yeah. it was kind of crazy. <laughs> wow. I wish I could have seen it. It was so much fun. <laughs> Well, you can still listen to them. Oh, though. yeah. I have one of the records at home, actually. It's not That's the greatest cool. copy, unfortunately. I have their second album on vinyl, but uh, I was mostly like a CD for them because the quality is, uh, it does make a difference. Actually, like as to what you said earlier, like if you were to listen to the mono version of the first Blue Cheer album and the stereo version, it's like a completely different album. Yeah. So you've at least, did you listen to it before? Uh, yes, but not on vinyl. That's cool. So, I mean, I was familiar with the record. I knew it was highly desirable. Oh, actually, I was looking for it for you. Oh, yeah, because I right. told you. Yeah. I remember I was like, I have a bunch of, I was like, I don't even know what albums to pick. I could pick five off my tattoos. Yeah, and, and I was, was like, the five first one I saw. Sent to me was, was just like, <laughs> oh, these are like kind of the hardest records to find. <laughs> well, I guess that is like a thing with me, though, is I did always like bands that were obscure, and I, I especially. As kind of like a metalhead elitist, I, I had a desire to always hear who did this first. Right. And it was like, you want to hear who played the first blast beat. It's like, right. who was the first band to use screaming death vocals. And if you're into metal and you go further back, like that was the weird thing is it's like you go before Sabbath and you find Blue Cheer. And it's re it was really weird to me because I was like, they have all the ingredients. And because they had a hit record... They act like it's weird because even Cream and Zeppelin claim them as an influence because they were the first band to be like everything on ten, right. no compromise, hit everything as hard as you can, and he screamed all of the vocals because it's like you couldn't even sing them loud enough into a mic for them to be heard. 
So I think it really is like the first example of a band that was like almost like a gang. They actually like I think they blew the PA system on the Tonight Show when they were on it or something. And Steve Allen introduced them on his show as like, ladies and gentlemen, the blue cheer, run for your life. And like, because he hated rock music. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you would even have them on. <laughs> Did you want to play like five seconds of one of this one or something like that? Yeah, man, sure. It is weird. Like, uh, they are a very different kind of record, and it does come with a disclaimer, like how to treat it. Yeah. The fact that it won't work on certain types of players. You're yeah. not supposed to have auto stop. And um, it's funny because it even shows a picture of my needle, and it's like, a needle like this is the, not the best one to use. But my other one had a needle like this too, and it still has like kind of a unique experience. Right. It's not vinyl. No. Like, and it sounds so different than the digital master. Yeah. Yeah, because I listened to this uh, through the band camp. This one is like thicker and more like, almost like boxy. Sure. Like, uh, it's sure almost knows. hard to separate any of the instruments. It's, it's like, has that mono attacking feel. Well, I'll tell you what. So, because I specifically listened to your download only of this record, and comparing it to what I remember of listening to the digital and listening to this now, granted, this isn't maybe the best system, but still, considered, considering we listened to that record from the 60s, yeah. <laughs> comparatively, I'm like, okay, they actually kind of sound like they're the same. Yeah, uh, you're well, recording on the digital. This was recorded in this house too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it sounds great. Like the digital. I actually recorded this vocal in this room, yeah. <laughs> like and the bass on this track and well, the so, harmonica. <laughs> so who mixed it and mastered it for you? Um, Is that different? This was done by. Uh, oh my god, I can't think of his. I'm like, I. Kn it's Kyle. I'm sorry, I blank. It's from Perfect. Kyle from uh, Cannibal Ramblers. Oh, so okay. it was actually, uh, I was a big fan of Cannibal Ramblers, and my drummer at the time, Greg, his band, The Dead LA, had recorded with them. And I'd only seen them, and I didn't really know them, yeah. but he introduced me to Kyle, and we kind of hit it off, and he really understood how to record my band. And I thought it was amazing, because we did these two, like, my previous drummer ran Turbulent Studios, a real professional recording studio. Yeah. That's why we were able to pump out so many albums in a short space of time. But this was done in almost the exact opposite fashion. We recorded the band tracks live in the basement here, and I did all the other stuff in this bedroom. And when I heard the digital, like, uh, when I heard it on Bandcamp, I was like, wow, it sounds like a studio. And it kind of taught yeah. me, like, that was actually how, like, I said to my brother, I was like, I need to put a name for the studio on the thing. What am I even going to call it? And he's like, well, my... My friends used to say this place was like the Waco Norton compound. Because that's the, that's the thing about the lathe cut um, records. Now, you know, plexiglass or not, you, do, you get a lathe cut uh, record, uh, even on vinyl, it's like, it has a shelf life. No, like, it's true. You, you legitimately listen to it a few times and it's just like, okay, I can't listen to it anymore. I have a couple of five inch ones that are like, they're tiny yeah. and they don't even play on almost any system. And it's almost like that's kind of the point. It's like you can't even listen to it. You pretty much just hold it. Jesus. <laughs> five okay. inches, a yeah. five-inch record. Weird. That was actually where I got the idea. Though I was like, I'll do a seven-inch like that. <laughs> well, so to go back to uh, you were speaking about recording this and uh, the engineer, the mixing and max mastering was done by oh Kyle from uh, Cannibal Ramblers. They're that actually playing a show. Cause he moved it was like his last recording project before he moved but oh. he's come back and done a couple of shows with them and i'm pretty sure he's doing one yeah. at dusk on the 24th I just saw the ad, yeah. which i definitely want to go to cool but he's a really nice guy he was definitely like a kindred spirit and i, th I think he was the first person who like heard us and really like whoa i understand like i know exactly what you guys are trying to do yeah and it was kind of like all right finally <laughs> <laughs> that's great man because some people are like, tell them we're a blues band, and then when we don't sound like that, they're like, I don't know what to what to do. <laughs> I don't know what to make of this, or where to put you guys in the lineup. Right. Yeah. Well, that sometimes makes the best bands, man. Well, I guess it's better to like, better to stand out than not stand out at all. Nobody ever got, like, I don't know. Nobody ever influenced any anybody by doing the same old thing. 
I definitely want to do like vinyl though. That's kind of like my next. It's part of why I've been doing two songs singles. Is like try to get somebody that'll put up money to be for a seven inch right. or something like that. Hey, well, uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming over. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I've been fucking here in Norton, Mass. It's, <laughs> it's cool, cool spot you're you're in though, man. I really, I really like it. I really Woods like. Having me. We're gonna try to do some golf now, the disc golf. Frisbee golf. <laughs> Let's throw a couple. <laughs> I wanna what? Well, come. That's why I grabbed a bunch. I'll try. Yeah, I'm gonna do it too. Well, that's yeah. what I mean. Is like, Let's so say. like, I mean, if you play like rules or buy holes, like, you go and pick it up every time. A lot of time, I just grab a whole bunch of them, throw them, then go, and then go pick them all up, and yeah. rinse, repeat. Because like, this isn't. This is almost like a really short shot. It seems far though. Kind but it's of far. like, uh, if you can, I mean, I've only even gotten it in from here, like, to there a couple of times. It's like basically it's like Yeah. 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 There you go. Oh, that's why you want to hit the chains. I see. A hole. Like, I've seen people shoot like this. They that's always it. throw it like it's a top. That's cheap. But it's like there's no rule against how you have to throw it. So, so I pick this up. I pick this up and I just go like that. Like, oh. There's a point. <laughs>